I build a movement here in Toledo. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Katrina Bacon. I'm a member of CSRN. Um, I'm also a member of the International Socialist Organization and a, a contributor to its publication, Socialist Worker. Um, and I'm a Toledo based activist. And I'd like to introduce our wonderful panelists. We've got Julian Mack. He's a CSRN member and a longtime community activist. We've got Terry Davis. She is a biology student at the University of Toledo, also a CSRN member and activist. And we've got Brother Washington Muhammad. He is a CSRN member and a member of the Nation of Islam. Uh, and they are going to be talking to you tonight about Black Lives Matter. Um, recently, we've had a situation in Toledo. You may have heard of Aaron Pope. Uh, Aaron Pope, at the time that he was arrested, was reported to be foaming at the mouth, flailing, having trouble breathing. And yet, TPD put him in a uh, restrained position via a knee to the chest. They then transported him to the hospital in the back of a squad car instead of calling an ambulance. And it took roughly 21 minutes to get from where they were to the hospital. Aaron Pope died two hours later. Um, on April 4th, the last demonstration that CSRN had, we had a Justice for Aaron Pope demonstration. And uh, we were hoping to keep building that movement and uh, keep the conversation going. There is no reason why somebody who is in medical distress should be treated that way by the police. There's no reason anybody should be treated that way by the police. Um, and so our wonderful panelists are going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to throw it over to them. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Julian um, I guess I should start at the beginning. Uh, I, I, well, the Trayvon That's when I originally lost faith in the criminal justice system for people that look black. Um, from that point on, you know, I've always been aware of current events, but after that, of course, the Mike Brown decision. Just situations happen all the time. And, you know, I just felt like sharing it on Facebook, um, talking about it with my friends wasn't enough. And I had to do more about it. And uh, so I started my own process by myself where I was on my lunch break. I just walked with my hands up. Started that in August, and uh, I did that for uh, seven weeks. Uh, and then a month later, after the Eric Garment decision, uh, before Black Friday, I ended up hitting the CSRN, and uh, we've been, you know, doing the best we can do to make people aware of the injustices that are happening right now here. And uh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Terry. I'm not going to reintroduce myself because Katrina did such a beautiful job, but um, I just want to tell you a I was not this, but I don't really watch the news a lot. But I started finding out more and more about things. Like uh, the first was Trayvon Martin that I saw, and I'm like, I don't agree with it at all. I think that was completely wrong. But I didn't jump into activism at that point because, you know, to me it was like that first incident. It was like that first thing, and then my ground happened, and then Eric Garner happened. And then Tamir Rice happened, and that's all I'm like, you know what? Something's not right. This is not an accident. This is this is a systematic rotation of my people. And I just I couldn't say it anymore. I mean, wait before that it was like when my crown happened, I kind of jumped. But at that point I was just pretty much like, I can't, I can't stay here and let this happen and not say anything. Because if you sit there and watch the fight, it doesn't go. 
And for me, I was just, something has to be done. And like, I have a daughter, so I'm forever thinking about her. It's like, what's gonna happen when she grows up and she has to deal with what I went through when I was 16 and I was unfairly arrested, thrown in a holding cell, and made to be out, made out to be like, a legitimate criminal when I was a straight A student in high school. I was in every club organization imaginable. I was a dancer, I was a singer. I had scholarships in my junior year. Actually, I had scholarships in my sophomore year of high school. I never so much as been in a fight. And officers arrested me and I attacked the deputy officer when there wasn't a deputy officer on the scene at all. I mean, they straight lied on me. It was worse when I got to my court case because the prosecutor tried to get me to do a plea. And I'm like, you want me to do a guilty plea at 16 for something I didn't do, for something that the person you said I attacked wasn't even there for me to do? And I just started seeing the difference in treatment between me and my white friend, my homegirl. It was something that happened to her, but she really did do it. She got arrested for petty theft. Prosecutor treated her like she was just the sweetest pie. And oh, honey, we all make mistakes. And, you know, no shade towards Emily because that's my girl. But when we went and we compared stories, I'm like, are you serious? So they only treated me different because of my skin color. So things just started to build up for me. And I, I just can't sit there and watch my generation and the future generation be subject to such, such foolishness. It's really the only thing I can think to call it. So. That's why I'm here. I just can't sit by and watch this happen. Well, uh, I'm Brother Washington Muhammad, and I'm here because of Terry. I'm here because of Julian. And I really have to applaud them. And, and you can too. <laughs> because, <laughs> if you look around in our, in our city uh, right now, you'd be hard pressed to find young people talking about issues like this. So I'm really in, in awe anytime I get an opportunity to sit with them and talk with them about things that are happening now. Unfortunately, for a lot of us older um, people, we can talk about the good old days because most of us are far removed from the realities of the today. I go to work, I go home. Right. I don't go to the Caribbean breeds. I don't go to um, whatever other type of um, club type thing. All right, that's a little plug for the Caribbean breeds. All right, so I got you. But but they experience it, and and it's awesome, uh, awesome, you know, to be to be with them. I'm involved because just the way that Black Lives Matter. I'll call a newspaper get a dollar. How they pull themselves up by their bootstraps? Well, for hundreds of years, we've been pulling everybody else up, all right? Uh, why are they so lazy? Well, we built America. We gave you 400 years of free work and labor. How lazy, you know, is that? And we have to understand that for black people here in America, we are damaged goods. For black people here in America, We've been reared by a foster parent that really didn't mean well to us. You can look at the institutions of school. Where do we rank the bottom? You can look at the uh, disparity in, in jobs and career and money making. Where do we rank? We rank at the bottom. You can look at health care, all right, and where black people rank. We rank at the bottom. Is that an accident 
or is that made to be that way? Um, we're the only people on the planet that have never governed themselves, ever. You can go to Puerto Rico, which was at one point a, uh, a slave colony. They governed themselves. You can go to Haiti, which at one point was a slave colony. They governed themselves. You can go to the Dominican Republic, which was once a slave colony. We have a told story of American white supremacy. Uh, when we talk about racism, we normally that that's not true because black people produce every color under the rainbow. All right, so it's not about the picture. Set up that always keep us behind and confuse you to make you think that well, black people are just. Um, just uh, genetically inferior, like the, the bell curve or, or any other type of excuse. This is an awesome book of government policy that has been put in place to always There's so many of us that are gatekeepers. The institution of white supremacy. To be a gatekeeper. This is why black. So now usually how we do these panels is <laughs> trying to remind it always ends up being an open discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, I can go through the process of that oh, for people. Um, so, <laughs> um, well, I, I'm going to be doing it, so uh, when we get to the discussion portion after our panelists have spoke, um, I have a stack here, which just means raise your hand, I'll put you on the list and you are... Sorry. Um, the question a lot of people ask me, one of the questions people ask me the most is why do we say black lives matter? And we get um, Absolutely. 
so why we say lives matter um, in regards to that part of the problem. So if you fix the worst part of the problem, you make all of the problem, uh, you know, go away or, or that we fix. So that's why we say Black Lives Matter. It's not a black supremacist statement, you know, so it's a, uh, it's a statement that uh, and if everybody adopts it, it helps, it helps everybody. So that's uh, why we say Black Lives Matter, because it specifically speaks to the worst part of the problem. And that's what needs to be addressed, the worst part of the problem. Um, and that helps all lives. We help Black Lives and help all lives. So that's why uh, Black Lives, that's why I, at least personally, say why I always say Black Lives Matter. Because when you say all lives matter, you know, that's start off that way. <laughs> Why do you say Black Lives Matter? <laughs> 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 Man, I'm, I'm like a super opinionated one, so. Yeah. All right, well, um, Black Lives Matter, I say, actually, strangely enough, no one has ever asked me why we adopt the Black Lives Matter mantra. Um, people have, however, asked me why don't we say all that. And I think it's the same thing that Julian said, is because you have to fix the worst part of the problem. A team is only as strong as, or a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And right now, our weakest link is that we are treating black people like sub citizens. We are treating black people like they really are three fifths of a person. Like we really are three fifths of a person. And I just, uh, just make my blood I say Black Lives Matter because. This is why I say I gave y'all forewarning. I'm super opinionated. You don't see no white people on the news getting shot in the back, running, getting shot and laying in the street for four hours until the coroner or whoever comes. Nobody is walking by shooting white people with hoodies and skittles and cans of and Like every time you see, it's literally gotten to the point where even we, even black people are looking like y'all awesome. a black person got shot on the news again. And it's becoming the norm. And that's what's bothering me because I'm seeing a lot of my people that just generally don't care. They have literally said, some of the people that I would call friends, oh, as long as it's not happening to one of my homies or one of my family members, I'm cool, they don't have nothing to do with me, but it does because as long as you're black, you're a target. I don't know if you know that or not, but I mean, you, yeah, I guess you just would love you enough to never have gotten pulled over for no reason or be subject to the stock and frisk law, which thank God we don't have here, but we, it's not a law, but it's definitely being enforced everywhere. So the problem that I'm having, and I think the topic that I want to see on was brainwashing of black people, but I guess we'll get on that later. Um, the, how can I say this? If you fill a person's head with so much of a distraction that they don't notice that they're being attacked, it's real easy to start picking us off. Because we don't even know we're targets anymore, and let alone that, we don't care. Because it's not happening to my cousin, or mom, or you know, whoever. Like, I got a little cousin that's basically like a son. He follow me everywhere, looks just like me. He's 11 years old. If something ever happened to him, I promise y'all have to give me some money. <laughs> because I just, I would not know how to handle it. Like, that's my boy. That's the only boy to be born in the Davis lineage since my dad's generation. And it's just, I, I think of it for him. No, I don't have a son, I have a daughter, but she's a target too. Because like I said, I've been arrested for something crazy. 
Something so crazy that the cocktail recipe didn't even show up to my court date, and that's why I got drunk. But I've been stopped and pulled over by cops. And I revealed they asked me if they could see my license. And I said, no, I'm not being charged. And it was my first time here, you know. I was still a peace officer in the state of California. And um, he got a little abrupt with me, and um, he wanted me to remember who he was talking to. So I pulled out, pulled out my gold sheet so that he could be aware of who he was talking to. He never did get my license. I never got charged, and I broke away. But I've also been pulled over simply because I'm black by uh, the University of Toledo uh, police. And when I filed a complaint against them, they said that, um, that they were justified. But unfortunately for them, we decided to pull over and just take pictures of all the black people who got pulled over by UT police that day and send it to Channel 13. And there's been time like that happened. I was after all night. Right. Was that the night I got arrested? No. no, that was the graduation party. Anyway, I was playing that. But <laughs> okay. my mom used to have a BMW. Actually, my mom used to have a lot of nice cars. And I remember getting pulled over once because they just didn't believe that a black person could be driving around with BMW and Toledo. So Chris Brock got pulled over three times in seven weeks. Um, I'm not yeah. sure what kind of yeah. car he drives, but it's, yeah, it's probably a nice one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if it's crazy. Yeah, if rich black guys are getting pulled over that much, like you can only imagine when it's like for <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, Chris Rock. Rock <laughs> yeah, if, if Chris Rock. Yeah, Chris Rock got pulled over three times in the past uh, month. You can only what it, imagine when it's like for a And I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, you know, the issue really. <laughs> But the issue, um, black lives do matter, and that is a big part of the issue. But there is a uh, socioeconomic aspect to the issue, um, where, frankly put, America has really never learned how to deal with people of power, uh, and that's part of the problem. Uh, mass incarceration. I mean, so after the civil rights movement. Uh, you know, we the war on drugs. And we know from prohibition, America's only had one amendment that's been turned back. It's pro it's, it's pro or, this is prohibition amendments. We know that prohibition doesn't work. <laughs> that has been the, you know, one of the biggest mistakes we've made in American history, if you really think about it. Um, but nonetheless, we get the war on drugs, uh, which primarily the war on drugs has been a war on marijuana. And uh, primarily they use that to target black and brown people and people of poverty. Those are the people who usually fall victim to the crime. Even though statistically speaking, uh, especially, you cannot talk about the mass incarceration of black people without talking about the war on drugs. We can just keep it real. You know, and the war on drugs primarily is not a war on all drugs, it's primarily a war on marijuana. Let's just keep it real. And so, uh, and it's not like they target all people for marijuana possession street. Specifically, the people that get caught for that um, are black and brown people or people that live in areas of poverty. And that's what's part of the problem. Um, and until we, you know, so we continue. Uh, so we get the war on drugs, uh, which began in the 70s. Um, we have more people, and then you get mass incarceration. The rate of people that are in jail has just exploded uh, over the past 30 years. Um, so we have, take this, and that's all because of the war on drugs. So you have uh, the same amount of people in total that were in jail in 1980 equal the amount of people that are in jail just for uh, drug offenses alone. It's crazy. We are 5% of the world's population in the United States. 
uh, but we account for one fourth of the people that are in jail. And we claim that this is the, yeah, the whole world, and we claim that this is a free country. I love America. There are a lot of great things about America, but that is one of the worst things. Period. And until we fix that, um, we got a problem here. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, John. <laughs> we have another question. Anybody have a question? No. I said, my name is Jack Cobra, and I know the problem is real, real bad. I'm a victim of it. I just want to ask one question. What, are, what, what will we start doing about this? 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 Well, one of the things we start doing is all right. One thing that's happened in the uh, in the post of all the time that President Obama has been in office, black people have stopped talking about the issue. Black people started believing that there is no more racism. Black people are buying uh, books. So I think that number one, we and services given to black people. We got to talk about the lack of leadership in our uh, account. Or we'll hold our books and our time. All we start discussing how did we get here? Still, uh, don't want to talk about the role that slavery has, and how do we get off from that? How do we get off of a slave? Diet? How do we get off of that former slave masters? How do that? Those are the things that. to swallow thinking that we were made Christian with Christian names by force. That hurts. And to work your way back from that is a lot of pain. All right, to meet somebody named Muhammad and think, oh, that's a weird name. That's your name. Or oh, why, uh, why are you a Muslim? That's an Arab religion. We the mothers and fathers of all of the religions. So number one is to get back in touch with who we are. Recognize that no one from Africa ever came for us. No one. Although some of us are very Afrocentric, some of us are very much into the red, black, and green, just as I am, but no one came for us. You can't name one African that came for us. All right, the teachers, who we were, where we come from. All right, and what we need to do in order to instill those values that we, we need in our community. That's treating each other the way you want to be treated, all right, and doing unto those the way you want to be done unto. I think this is uh, going to have a question. All right, yeah, we have a gentleman in the hat, and then we have Vince. Okay, I'd like to, um, yeah, it's clear. Um, I'd like to get some clarity because he spoke to the social economic aspect of how drug crimes are handled. I mean, if you speak to the social economic aspect of it, you group it together. But if you want to talk about statistically, the amount of time that a black man gets for a crime is disproportionate to that of a white counterpart, even if they're from the same circumstance. Twenty percent more. Yes. So to say that it's it comes from poverty or it's a it's a war on on poverty. No, it's a war on black people. It didn't introduce the flow of drugs in California into a white suburb. They introduced them to a predominantly black community. They're not 75% of traffic stops in the city on, under the suspicion of drug possession isn't in our white hills. It's in our neighborhood. That's right. So they're 10 times more likely. To, 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 you're right. right. If they're there after 3 o'clock at night, that's probably what they're doing. I may be coming home from work. So to say that it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a poverty thing or 
that takes away from the intensity of where it needs to change. We can approach religion, we can approach the conversation, but in that aspect, it's just dialogue. It needs to be, if we're going to talk about it, we need to talk about how do we hold our political leaders accountable. If we're going to hold them accountable, that means that when they ask for the donation, yeah. they don't get it. You're right. That's not dialogue, that's action. That's right. When they come here, we say, oh, let me take a picture with you, Marcy Capri. Okay, that's done for. What the hell happened to us losing uh, funding for our, our extracurricular that's activities right. in our school? You see, that's if we want to have dialogue, it's what are we actually talking about to solve the problem? You see, we can we can go on finding an identity. We can go on trying to a diet, you know, and reach back to our roots. But inevitably, that doesn't change the problem because we have to find real solutions. Because every day, people still get locked up for right around the corner. The police is pulling somebody over, snatching them off the street, regardless if their name is Muhammad, James, Cody. Right? They still get pulled off the street. So if the system is set up to, I feel, oppress specifically our people, then we need to address that system in itself, not just we need to change us and how we do. Change, change, change. Uh, that's you're absolutely right. Um, you're absolutely right, and, and that's the biggest part of the problem. Like, is the, is the fact that is there is intentional prejudice and intentional injustice to be sort uh, to a certain type of people, right? But that is not the, the entire part of the problem. And I feel you, and I feel you, but there is a poverty aspect to it too. Like there are people who are making money off of black people being treated like this. And at the end of the day, we live in America where, you know, money rules everything. Like the reason why this is, why is so why is that happening? It's not just like, it's not just because people don't like us. It's because there's a profit to be made because of that. You know, so if you, I personally believe that if you fix, once again, you fix the worst part of the problem, fix all of it. You, you know, you fix everything up from that, it's better. So a big part of the, there, like I said, there's a huge racial part to it. And that's why I specifically say black lives matter every time I talk about this, because it's some you know, direct uh, prejudice towards black people, especially black people like me and you. But why is that happening? Because there is profit to be made off of us being poor and broke. Really, really, that's what it is. is there's, there's profit to be made off of us being poor and broke. And, and, yeah, yeah. No, ignorant, they just try to keep us ignorant to keep us poor and broke. You know what I'm saying? This is America. That, that rules everything. So, so, okay, my bad. Okay, so, so like, yeah, so, so, that, that, yeah. So if you fix poverty, though, if you fix poverty, I feel like that does that. Aside from the racial aspect, that's the other part to it. Just let me get that question so we can move forward. Yeah, but we're not the most yeah. poor. If we speak to poverty, more white people are on welfare food stamps true. than we are. But who's looked at Native Americans too? They sit on reservations. Latin Americans have multiple. Families. Coming over here, if you're born here, you get citizenship for your mom and your man. But we don't, that's, that's not the issue. Poverty is a problem. But the money that we generate, if we're not talking about how we're going to re, how can I put it, re, redistribute, redistribute, the wealth, redistribute the wealth it's, it's not going to change everything. But we need to fix us. And right. what's Messes me up is when we try to say, "Oh, it's all people," and it's it's not Good. because it's just us. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's go to the next comments because I want to make sure that everybody gets their point. Um, so we have Vince next, and then after that, we have the gentleman in the checkered shirt. My question piggybacks on what this gentleman just says. Uh, this question is for anybody in the panel. Um, what role do you think of the television? Uh, 
programs, Hollywood movies, play into stereotyping and, and pigeonhole um, certain people as being uh, in, you know, less than human equally. I'll take it. I want to say that I was really, really it is. Everybody knows your biggest partner. I'm gonna say everybody knows, but your biggest partner development is between the ages of I believe three. That's when you get like a sponge. You're gonna soak up everything you show. With that being said, as kids between those ages today that are so drugs, um, the then I I have to be there because I watch it mm -hmm. but I hate it because of the as being the president's horn. And our young black women are seeing this and thinking that's okay. Mm -hmm. So we we have that, and then we have shows like Love and Hip Hop, which shows that every black woman walking the street is cat and all they want to do is fight each other and pull out leashes. Mm -hmm. Then we have <laughs> <laughs> there was no right, right. And if we don't know how to come together and educate our kids, and people like refuse to believe that this is brainwashing. What else could you call it? Because before this came on, we were kings and queens and we knew it. Mm -hmm. He knew it. And well, here's another way to portray Anytime that we, anytime that there's a crime that we've done, we're put on TV as the black man and black woman proof. Mm -hmm. But when it is not us, they're almost dehumanized. The individual, the group of people, they are never specified. And then that is common <laughs> across all people. When it comes to us, it's immediately that black person. You think we're just suspected, but if it's anybody other than a person of color, and they'll show the worst possible picture they can find. I was at a couple comparisons this weekend where um, two young black men uh, did a robbery somewhere, and then three young white men did a robbery somewhere. They showed these two young black men's mugshots. The pictures they showed of these three white men were their college pictures. Blazers and ties, nice haircut and everything. You're not going to show their mugshots. You know why? Because you want America to sympathize with them. Oh, they're just kids, and you know, they're just having fun. Give them, throw a little community service out and it'll solve the problem. But the young black gentleman throw a book at them. They go into jail, plus community services, and fines, parole, probation, all of that. This is the same thing I was speaking about earlier, how me and um, my friend Emily, this white girl I know, she got arrested for something she actually did. And the prosecutor didn't offer her a plea bargain, which is, oh, you know, we all make mistakes. But then the prosecutor comes at me and we want you to take this plea bargain for something we didn't see, nor can we prove you did, and I didn't do it, by the way. There was no way I could have possibly done it, because the person who said I did it too wasn't in there. So, it's just, they portray us in the worst possible way. I looked up from my mom's social thought class a picture of Trayvon Martin, or, um, was it Trayvon Martin? No, it was Mike Brown. There was a picture going around of Mike Brown that was for those of us hip hop listeners there. It was actually a picture of a gang with no shirt on, showing all his tattoos. And people for the longest actually thought. So, I go to counter current news, I go to Melissa Harris Perry, I go to 
But in those terms, I go to people like that because you can't trust the media. They are not only trying to portray us to other people as something that's not human, something that's dark and bad, but they're also trying to portray us to ourselves, to our youth who don't know any better. And sad to say that a lot of parents at home don't know any better either. And all they see is sex, guns, lies, videotapes, drugs, all that. And it's crazy because it's like now you're trying to mess with our youth. <laughs> And there's not to be enough of us around to show us any difference. I don't want to be a taskmaster, but we have six people to speak. So I'm gonna, if it's all right, I'm gonna move on to the next person, the gentleman in the checkered shirt. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Lucas, and uh, I want to take back actually off of the, the two speakers before this one right here. I want to talk about accountability and mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. um, Part of my great frustration with what I've seen in Toledo since I've been here the last five years is uh, there is a failure of grassroots and community leadership. Yeah, that's no disrespect to anybody who considers himself a leader in Israel. But there are numerous opportunities to focus the community's attention, whether you focus through the media or not on the issue of Black Lives Matter. There are a number of the problems that we face are political in nature. There are politicians in office. Those politicians all, at some point in time, run for re-election. Uh, the fellow who just got killed down in South Carolina, there's speculation that he ran because he was afraid of being locked up for child support. Well, child support is a political creation. <laughs> it's enforced by by judges who are elected, they're politicians. And guess what? In Toledo, we have some of those same judges who are about to be up for re-election. So it just seems to me that the community would say, Black Lives Matter, the child support system, there's a problem with us locking up people, and, and including in local jails and prisons. And so we ought to have a dialogue, a conversation with the judges and with the politicians who give the judges authority to lock people up over child support. That's just one issue. And so, but I don't see that happening. Uh, uh, I don't see that conversation happening at all. Most, most folks don't even know who the juvenile court ju judge is or, or who the domestic relations judge is or who the, the local politicians are. And so, when, whenever there's a mass shooting, the anti-gun people use the tragedy as an opportunity to focus on the gun issue. And so, when there's a black death, I don't see us, nobody I don't think has, has contacted Edna Brown and said, you know what, Senator Brown, we want you to go down to Columbus since you are representative. We elected you to represent us. And we want you to, to say that this is a problem of child support being used to incarcerate black people so much to the point that where some of them, they shouldn't run, we all know that, but some of them are, 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 are not going to be able to pay the child support or, or maybe they just be stuck. But I just think we ought to have a discussion about whether or not we think it's appropriate to lock black people up and there are thousands of them across the state who are locked up over child support. And so, uh, another issue uh, along those same lines, maybe y'all think they're along those same lines, is, you know, we got these skinheads. <laughs> and, and to me, that's a, their message is, black lives don't matter. And, and, and I just feel like if Minister Farrakhan, if we had, if, if somebody had invited Minister Farrakhan to come to town, the community throughout the city would not be about whether or not Mr. Farrakhan has a right to come to town or whether or not he has a right to exercise free speech. The conversation would be about what rights do we give to hate monks. I don't think Mr. Farrakhan is a hate monk, but I'm just keeping it real. That's what the conversation would be about. What can we do to stop this hate monger from coming to Toledo? And yet we play into this whole thing. Well, we ought to just ignore. We are we we, we plan into today into their hands if we 
is we give them any the attention. That's all they want. We shouldn't say nothing. We shouldn't do nothing. We should just let them come in here. And if they make threats against black people, we should just ignore. I don't think that. I don't think those messages are compatible. Either Black Lives Matter, and we shouldn't allow people to disrespect black people and threaten our lives and tell us that our lives don't mean nothing. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. right, we're gonna keep it going with that. Right. We got something. Mm -hmm. Well, we got a couple of things to respond to that, but right. you know, at least to get to have everybody get their comments heard. But what he posed an awesome question that we got locked down. Yeah, right, we can take a couple of that. comments and then we'll yeah. do a little bit of response. Wait, 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 Thirty seconds. Like, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thirty seconds. So let's go. Let's go. No, 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 really quick. Um, there's, a, there's a problem with institutionalized racism. We talk about it a lot, but one, there's a problem with institutionalized racism. So oftentimes we get, uh, on all kinds of levels, we get a black face and a white place. And because that's new, we're happy about it, right? And that is good, you know, because that, that is a source of progress, that's a sign of progress. Um, but there's still forces from that institution where that racism affects their decision making and that's really what needs to change. It's the institutionalized racism. So even though you have a, and that goes even up to the president, like there are blacker things that I'm sure President Obama wants to do, but the institution, the government, the White House, prevents him from having the freedom to be able to do something like that. So that's that. Um, education and judges. Uh, yeah, nobody really knows what our judges do because they're not part of a political party and nobody really keeps track of that. That's something that can, in general, improve uh, with the political process. Um, as far as child support and all that, um, over the past 30 years, as um, things are, are changing, um, and you know, there are, we're re, as we're reevaluating gender in our society, I think that parent rights uh, need to be looked at in a totally different way, you know, and that that's something that that's a conversation we can have in all different kind of ways. Uh, because as, as we're reevaluating as a culture, our society uh, has to do a gender. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so I'd like to go to the next question. That was the gentleman over here. Yeah, my name is Colbert again. And my question was what are we going to do with uh, I didn't hear much, but I was in general speaking about, I mean, us, Black Lives Matter, yeah. period about the man just got gunned down, the man in the paddy wagon got killed uh, and the police department just says that um, they said that the person done something to them that caused them to have to do that. But I was in a situation eight years ago that I still have a medicine charge that they say that I uh, ran at him when he had the gun on me and I tried to charge him and he shot me once. He said I I still was coming, he shot me again, and he shot me again. But, you know, that's not true. So what I figured after eight years and all the five lawyers lied, did what they did, the judges did what they did, and I'm still stuck with a medicine, and I have no support groups, all the churches, all the pastors I talked to, everybody backed out like they were scared for whatever reason. I was scared a little, but I ain't scared today. You know what I'm saying? If you don't know whatever, but the problem is now I still have a problem that that cop who killed two people still walks the street. Nobody has said anything about it. Nobody is it's like they're very scared of the cop or whatever. But here's the thing. The Justice Department I talked to said if a group comes together, that they would come check out the city. You know what I'm saying? Enough complaints. But a group has to come together. I mean, we can sit and talk. We're a group. And if black lives really matter, we should try to probably do something about it than just sit and talking about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, something has got to be done about it. You got cops that hate blacks, you know what I'm saying? And so here's me, I'm still living. The boy, all the names right there, everybody's dead. And they said that they did certain things. He can't take a uh, lie detector test. I will pay for my own after eight years figuring out that that's not all I need to do. Like the man who did 30 years in jail and he tested the gun, but now if he run, he's the cop. So I'll pay for mine, or if you know a system, or wherever it could be, I'll pay for it to take it just to show you that they lied. They lied about the boy who was on the ground, the Marino shot, 
and he was asleep. Five minutes later, two cops came, and he said in the report that they were. I was struggling. The other two cops, that guy was asleep for five minutes, and they came and took his head and beat it on the ground four times. And I said, he came four times and shot me three times. That's terrible. The judge. Everybody that signed that, if all these come up, right. the only with the Justice Department, we would have to call the Justice Department and they would come check it out. We would call folks. But if we don't make that call, we don't do that. We don't call at the Brown, we don't call up. We're not going to go for you. We got to. Somebody got to make the call. If you don't, I'll make the call. Hey, Mr. Cole, you can be the I'll make. I'll go to Washington. I'll make them see that there's a problem here. I will make them see that there is a problem here. You have to hear me. It's better to hear from me. Let me take the lie detector test or whatever. Better to hear from me. I live. Good right. Lord, let me live through it. So, I mean, let me take the test for all of them. Yes, so you can just sit here and say, I'm not lying. And you know what? If I die right after, I don't care. At least you know the truth. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? Um, I think that's the gentleman in the back. You? Well, I'm looking to over. I'm here for solutions. I'm not here to be the problem. We all know what the problems are. So I'm here to uh, get answers. What are we going to do? Like, like Mr. Coker said, we all know the problem. I'm not here to be the problem. Everybody knows what the problem is. So the question is, what are we going to do? No. Hey, so wait a minute. Good. So um, we need to develop a black think tank to think of, to analyze our problems and propose a concrete solution for this community. That has not been done. So somebody, this group or some amalgam of leadership, we need to come together and map out a plan, an economic plan and a political plan for the district. So, you know, we face the problem. I know what the problems are. I'm with this folks. What are we going to do? That's what I want to hear. I know what the problems are. Those of us who have been harassed or 
just without cause arrested or anything by police. We're trying to get these incident reports out here and filled out so we can go to the Justice Department or the police department and what have you. And essentially, she's probably not going to do this, but basically, like, throw them at the doorstep. Like, we got 100, 200, 300 incident reports. This is what you're doing. And make copies of it. And that's what we want to send to our to our council men and women. That's what we want to send to our statesmen and say, like, we got 200 people here talking about y'all ain't doing your job. Once you present that hard evidence, and this is just what I'm saying, what we have right now. Once you get, once you are able to present hard evidence, like, look, this is two, three hundred people. You have to do something about it. And I asked you a question about. I just want to say, right, if anybody wants to fill out an incident report, how many do you have now? If you've been checking about how many do you have? That's Ms. Tyler's operation. So if you can get in touch with Tyler, they I can tell you. I can tell you. We had two forums where we invited the public out to anonymously fill out a form if you've been uh, approached by the police. For two days we sat for six hours at the library. My son, I sent my son. Nobody else came. We did it again. All right, so we talk, we talk a talk, all right? But when it's time for us to show up, we shut down. We get scared. All right? We told everybody to meet us in front of the police station last week. You didn't know what we were going to do. Look, we could have ran up in there. We could have did all the stuff that you talk about. We said everybody meet us. They meet us at Jackson and Erie. We out here. Who show up? A couple of white people, Rob and, and a girl. So, so miss, look, look, miss me with all of that. If that's what you want to do, try to stand up and be a leader about that. I wanted to bring awareness about police brutality in our community. I wanted to bring Black Lives Matter because too many times we think about Negroes and African Americans. I did that. All right, I did that. I invited you here. You look, you want to bring, you want to do that. Try to stand up and get a group of people around you to stand for that and do it. We wait for leaders, damn it, they ain't coming. You wait, look, wait for the NAACP. Then wait for the Nation of Islam. Wait for somebody to bring your bread out the sky. Damn it, you're gonna be waiting a long time. Decide, look, I don't give a damn if you want to protest or you think we can get some AR-16s and run up in that bitch. That ain't gonna happen unless you do it first. Do it first. Do it first. Do it first. I look, look. I want you. I want you. Look, I didn't. I didn't been there. If you want to do it, you know it. I'm with. I'm with it. I grew up in a police station. All right, I, I, I can't win going to the police station. No, but I'll do it for you. Damn it, I'll do it for you. Listen here. All right, guys, it's coming up on 720. I want to get back to the stats if y'all want to be talking. So I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. You want to go in there with an AR-15 and shoot them? Right? No, no. I'm just talking about what everybody that want to stand for. No, your issue is valid because you're still alive. We got a witness. But you, brother, we got a witness and we got a testimony. If we wanted to back anybody, we back you. And I'll tell you what, the day we back you, you'll see maybe myself, a couple of white people, and a girl. And a girl. All right. All right. <laughs> so if that's what we got to do, we do it. We just need all that other stuff. All right, this ain't that type of part. Hey, brother. I'm going to be here. Yes, I am. You know my work? I'm going to be the cruel taskmaster now and get back to the stack. Um, I have put myself on the stack, but I would like to switch positions with the uh, sister with the glasses. I think you should go first. Oh. Hello. Um, my name is Mary Moore. I'm here. Um, I'm the artist here in Toledo. Awesome. Um, and um, speaking on behalf of media or influence of media, like she said, that was a household problem. But um, us as members of our own unique households, I do feel like we do have an obligation ourselves as well to our children to continue to take them in the ways that 
can't expect for our community outside or the media outside to do something. Now, me as an artist in the community, a musical artist, we in the artistic community, we have things going on that will enlighten, you know, our community and a lot of the things that are going on, you know, economically or socially. That projects that we work for, not necessarily financial support as in being there, being able to see before we got to turn that thing on. And then even then, you know, the things that we see, you know, I really growing up didn't have much of a desire because I knew that it wasn't it wasn't the truth. It wasn't for me. It wasn't designed for me in the way that it needed to be. However, us as artists, especially here in Toledo, in this community, we are trying to provide certain outlets for our younger children, for our younger generation, as well as those of our own. But that's a whole other story because mm -hmm. you know we have a whole other mentality for our own now. But um, we're, we're trying to provide revenues for our children to be able to know the truth and to see the truth, a truth that is important for them to know, a truth that, you know, some of us growing up, we have been hidden from because our parents or our caretakers were too afraid to show us these things, but we, they need to know these things. They need to know about the police brutality and that's mm -hmm. they see everything else. They're seeing all the sex, they're seeing all the scandal, you know, and I love scandal, <laughs> why? But um, it's, it's, I, I, I don't even watch TV because I know it's all, it's, it, it's all trash. And so, basically what I'm saying is, like, like they're saying, we, we talk about we want this to happen, we want that to happen. It's for people, you know, in those things that we want to happen, yet we don't get much of this. So we have on YouTube or if you are current in the social network, listen, if you don't know how to operate a computer, there's classes out there. Get into it because technology is taking over the world. And if you don't know how to use a computer, at least the simplest way, you will be lost. But, you know, they have computer classes, and that's a whole other story, too. But use a computer. Get on YouTube. Watch our shows. Watch our videos. We're doing things. Share them. Ask your granddaughter, how do you share a video on Facebook? You know, and continue to promote because that's the only reason we can get the, the word out there of what's going on, what we're doing is by visual. People seeing, people hearing, people aren't believers until they see. That's the reason why the, the stuff started blowing up in the first place. It wasn't until they got on the news saying how such and such was shot and killed. You know, this is stuff that's been, these are issues that have been going on with us for years. And now all of a sudden, you know, yes. it's like, Oh, and it's and when people are just just uh, getting hot, and that's because it's it's you're seeing it everywhere. It's visual, right. visual, 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 all about the visual. And so, and there's others like me out here. So, with that being said, support, support these children, bring them up and up, and they will not flee from that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's it's important. Media is an institution as well, as an institution, and that has an institutionalized racism part of it as well. It's institutionalized in America. Um, but we're in the middle of a revolution. I don't think we really know it yet. Um, that's 200 years or so. The, you know, the people who have gotten rich and continue to get richer and richer. But there is a significant change in that culture. You can't talk about media, talk about social media. Mm -hmm. That's changing the world. Like, it doesn't matter if you're talking about number one in Brazil, you're learning about how blocks down the street, people are living in deep poverty. While the billion, billion dollar stadium, billions of dollars being made at that point in time, that's because of social media. Remember the Arab Spring mm -hmm. in Egypt? 
What's that? How did that happen? People were meeting in uh, Tahir Square, thousands of people. Because of Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. That's the social media revolution. Black Lives Matter. What is Black Lives Matter? Why are we even saying Black Lives Matter? It's because that's a hashtag. Pound sign, Black Lives Matter. And you click on Black Lives Matter when you click on social media and you see a whole list of that. Even to speak to that, kids mm-hmm. who were, I say like I saw some 15 or 16 year olds, this is funny, but it's sad. That they looked on like a phone and they were like, why is there a hashtag on the phone? Facebook didn't exist back then. They were looking at like the <laughs> phone. They did not know that it was a pound sign. That right there, the social media is taking over. You got kids that don't know what the pound and the hashtag are the same thing and it belongs on the phone. Yeah. Well, All right. Yeah, I, truly, I truly believe that because of social media, like there's a shift and there, there's, there's power that's given back to the people. So this, this is important. There's power that's given back to the people. We have a platform. We all have our own stage with our social media. Use your social media wisely. You know, don't just, you know, you can use your social media to change the world. It's real. It gives you a voice. Use it. All right. I'm going to get back in the stack here. Um, my name is actually up next. Um, okay, so I'm Native American. Uh, I know how my culture is constructed. I'm black to I'm skipping on me. Um, and it's a collective culture. We share things collectively. Things are taken care of. Children are taken care of by the entire community. Mm-hmm. And a lot of black and African communities are like that as well. And yet we've lost that because we've gone into this hyper-individualized, you know, you have a child, you have to pay for that child's daycare and health care. You have to pay for, you know, uh, food and a roof over their head. You have to do all of this by yourself. And eventually that child is going to go on and make money for somebody else, make a bunch of money that they're never going to see. (laughs) This is the system of social reproduction. This is how families are reproduced under capitalism. So to get back to that idea of a collective family, I think is really important. And especially in an economic sense, we have to have collective economics from a need-based perspective instead of a cash-based perspective. That's the way we get quality all children. It's the way we're going to get quality child care for all children. I think the point about uh, uh, is really, really good because we have pressure on the individual unit to provide for the child instead of the community at large providing for the child. So you have poor black people who are being, you know, put in jail for these child support charges when really we should be having a community in which children are a priority. In which children, there is no question that a child deserves health care and education and, and, and daycare and things like that. Mothers deserve to have nurseries in their workplaces. They deserve to have paid time off. We are one of the, we are the only industrialized country that does not have maternity, paid maternity leave for women. We don't have any paid parental leave. It's barbaric. It's barbaric. Um, so uh, that's kind of what I wanted to say is just the economics of the situation are really severe, and I do think that they contribute to. Um, anti-black violence for, on the on the part of the police. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was me, and I'm gonna switch it over to Jody. So I'm gonna. Hi Jody. Hi Jody. Hi Jody. I like her. Watch out, Jody. 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 Oh, is it my turn? Yeah. Uh, we know that there's a lot of nonviolent drug offenders in prison. Uh, we also know that the property crimes that are committed are also usually committed by people who have addictions. Uh, our system is based on a punitive uh, system of reformation instead of a rehabilitative uh, system of reformation. If we emphasize rehabilitation first, Seventy percent of the people that are in prison now would not be in prison, mm-hmm. whether it was for a property crime because of a drug addiction, or drug addiction, or drug sales, or whatever. Now I know that Toledo just passed something about a rehabilitation thing for heroin. I know that there's also a ballot measure possibly coming up on decriminalization of marijuana. Uh, these are the types of things that I think uh, this community could focus on because the impact that it has on the community, the punitive measures taken because of the, the drug war, uh, I think uh, focusing on 
changing the model uh, when we interdict drugs from punitive to rehabilitative would have a huge impact, not, not only on the black community, on the Latino community, communities with poverty, any place where there is a level of malaise, despair, whatever, uh, that would change the entire nature prison to pipeline system by shifting it away from punitive to rehabilitative instead of incarceration, put them in treatment. Yeah, and that's why uh, prohibition doesn't work. You know, that's why we, uh, you know, are allowed to sell alcohol now. And um, you have to get rid of the black market. You know, that's why, that's why, that's where so much of our crime comes from.
I do have somebody who is waiting on staff. I can't put you on staff, though. I don't want to uh, ignore anybody. Uh, we had uh, Terry's mom was next. Sorry. <laughs> Terry's mom was next. Sorry, Pam. Um, I want to talk about the part of Black Lives Matter that we don't really think about, and that's human trafficking. And the reason why I can talk about human trafficking is because I've been in it. I'm not American born, I'm Haitian born. And I was brought over to this country because somebody sold me three times before I was seven years old. There, I can tell you how one of the things the brother up here said is that people benefit from our demise. You can put it in that way. But somebody benefited from me until I was 18 years old. They benefited in selling me. I had a conversation with um, Antoine Fisher. He told me how it works in Ohio. Overwhelmingly, you can speak to this. African American children are the, are the highest, the largest group in the system, in, in the uh, social, child welfare, child welfare system. What happens is they are paid to sell one another. What happens is you'll see kids that can be standing on a corner, they'll be selling cards, the cards for like 200 bucks a pop. What they do is they sell the names and the addresses and the birth dates of the other African Americans that are in the child welfare system so that the moment they come out within 48 hours, within 48 hours, they are propositioned into human trafficking, and if they say no, they're taken. And one of the things that happens is that um, after parental rights are taken, quite often, more often than not, the social security number is changed so that the parents can't use them to get benefits. So then when it comes to the AFCARs, the, um, I know what AFCAR means, the, the stats that they provide yearly, a whole bunch of black folks appear to be missing. But the reason why they're missing is because nobody's looking at them. That's right. What happened when it came to the community being your family, when the community watched out for you? Now a whole bunch of us are gone. A whole bunch of us are missing. A whole bunch of us are still being sold, and we're supposed to not be in slavery anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know who has the highest child, uh, the highest human trafficking in the country? Toledo. The city of Toledo. Yep. Yeah. Right here. The city of Toledo. Minor trafficking. <laughs> and the thing is, we don't understand. We have an idea that most human trafficking is, is, is for sex slaves. I wasn't sold into that. That isn't what I was sold into. And I, I'm not going to give you all that information, but we need to step up more. We have to step up more. We have to talk about all of the issues that bother us. And when you talk about talking to the Department of Justice, my daughter has forgotten that she knows the conciliator for this area. She's known that I have been all for life. We know the one that cover the two that cover us. One is in Chicago, the other one is in Detroit. If you want justice here, they've been the conciliator that covers this area, a black woman, a doctor, a graduate of the University of Toledo, also a professor, who has been a professor there, we know her. Her family's here in the city. We know how to get her here. So however we have to stand up, I feel like I don't have anything to lose. You know, my feeling is they don't even know a citizen. And the only reason why I know is because I had DNA tested. That's, that's another thing. We can have DNA testing. They can take a piece of your bone or a piece of your tooth and tell you what part of the country you grew up in, where you were born, what your heritage is. I'm Haitian born, but I live here. My daughter is a first generation American. My granddaughter is third generation. And I've been through enough in this horrible country. I've got a sister who refuses to live in this country because every time she crosses the border, they stop her because they think that she's a hooker or that she's trafficking. And you know what her husband does? He's a federal peace, a federal peace officer who investigates the kind of crimes that she gets blamed for every time she comes into the United States. Just because she's a black woman. Mm -hmm. Because she's thin, she's model pretty, got long hair. <laughs> this is pretty much why they get her every time. And her kids too, my little cousins too. Well, Alicia daughter, I mean, but they just, they do that every time they come home, every time. But I wanted to speak to the fact that, you know, when Washington keeps saying slavery has had an effect on us, yeah, because it hasn't ever ended. You know, you look at folks that go into social media and they create avatars, these avatars are their, their alter egos. And, and studies have shown that in these people creating alter egos, that they're able to do mind control 
with this. They can control you to be anything they want you to do to be. That's why they, they have created programs where you can have your avatar look like you. They started out doing it and so that you can see yourself exercising, see you losing weight. And it started to change people. They aged them, you gave them money, and it changed their behavior. And then you notice when people are trained now, instead of taking something up in an airplane, what do they do? They put them in a simulator. When they train people to do things now, they put them in a simulator. We're being manipulated. Social media, if you're on Facebook, the law says now. There are agreements on you post. They are listening to you. That is under the, the Patriot Act. They see everything you do, every time. All right. Y'all probably are on the fly list. <laughs> um, I want to I move to uh, Sister that I hear often, which is, you know, support our solutions. Um, I just want to say that I think the, the value is really in the whole process because if you don't, like, backtrack to the root mm -hmm. and people don't understand that, we'll end up treating symptoms rather than the root problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. We have to realize a lot of our young people, they're young to us, all of their adults, being in the 20s and 30s, yeah. don't have a strong connection to their history. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even when they said we were kings and queens, but we're more than kings and queens because we were made by the Creator. We're gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so our history, you know, they got stuck in Africa, as if Africa don't need help too at this point. And so it's really important that, um, you know, we kind of restore our oral tradition. Otherwise, we might start building solutions which really only get to the symptom of a problem. For example, and then I also want to say that it's plenty of despair for all of us to get to so. So, you know, if you have a passion for one thing, and I know this is not necessarily his passion, he just used it for an example, but like about the um, child support issue. I concur. When, when he said that, I immediately say the same thing, that how is that going to help anything to put our brothers in jail or to criminalize them? They certainly can't be a father if they're in jail. Okay, mm -hmm. so if we want to approach um, our local politicians, then well, that's the job that I'll do because I have passion for it. And then we'll back you. Yeah, because I think everybody's saying something similar, and that is when we rise up to do something positive, then you see the support is so little. Yeah. And uh, what, what you want, because the masses are not educated enough, they don't have enough understanding of their history, they don't feel courageous enough, they don't understand our potential well enough. You know, to get in the fight and feel like they don't have to apologize for saying Black Lives Matter. I'm not done saying I'm sorry mm -hmm. I said Black Lives Matter instead of All Lives Matter. How can All Lives Matter if Black Lives don't matter? Mm -hmm. and, um, so, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Get in where you fit in. Whatever your piece of passion, we'll back you, you back us, and we'll be like the awesome dream team. You know, that's right. Right. the center of change in America coming out of Little Toledo, Ohio. We need, we need, you know, somebody had to teach them skill, like the brother who said he got business. Somebody had to teach them skill. Somebody had to teach them how to use their education so they didn't get smart and give all their money away to somebody else as soon as they turn 18. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody had to teach them how to be responsible to accountable to their families. Somebody had to teach them that drugs are kids. If you kill your mom and your sister by selling them drugs, you're killing yourself. You know, somebody got to do a little bit. Some of it happened to the church. Some of them don't have no more religious people. You know, some of it happens, you know, with, through the months. Some of it happens in the community center. So I think we all just got to put our foot down and don't be um, like, a, you know, blowing in the wind. We got to be like trees planted by the water and back each other up. That you We get hungry. Are you Muslim? Are you Christian? Are you in front of our night? They think you don't deserve that part. You look like you got tattoos on. No questions asked. You could be an innocent kid. No, none of those other things matter. We've got to really learn how to unify and stick to it. Okay. Look at this it's like a trend. Mm -hmm. when it's a trend, mm -hmm. what's going to happen five years to me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So, and with that, unfortunately, we're running short on time. So, I want to thank you for all of your comments. Thank you for all of your questions. Now, this doesn't here in somewhere Network Toledo on our Twitter, our Facebook, and continue the discussion there. Sure, keep it moving, keep it going. Um, again, thank you for all of your comments. Thank you for showing up. I'm going to go to Brother Washington so we can close this. Uh, Next Saturday, we're having Black Lives Matter Day 418. This happened, these young people said, I was that one that said, don't go downtown. I was the ones that said, let's be quiet. I was the that said, let's not give them that attention. I was that old damn leadership that's taking us to hell. That was me. One of these young people said, wait a minute, we can do both. We can have, we can shut it down right here, and we can shut it down downtown, all right? So they opened my eyes up to another way of leadership. So now we're going to be here, all right, giving our people an alternative, not just lip service, all right? But also, we got a team, there's a team that you see, and there's a team that you don't see. And unfortunately, sometimes black people talk too damn much. Yeah. All right, we put our strategies out there too damn much so that the age can come in and foil it. But no, we got a group downtown. We got a group that's going to be watching as the city of Toledo. Listen, listen, turn around because you got to hear this. Oh, no, I want you to hear it. The Nazis don't even have a, a parade permit. In order to have a listen. In order to have a parade permit, you got to pay for your police, $75 an hour. They've got 600 police that's going to be uh, on call that day for two hours, $45,000 an hour. How long are they going to be there? Two hours. That's your damn money. All right? You think you're going to let our money be downtown without us not being there? You're a damn fool. All right? No. So, no. Time out for that old That is about planning. It's a deal. Yeah. All right. We look. Okay. Yeah. Oh, look. But look, just like we say, not all police are bad, but no, enough of them to create a damn problem. Not all fools, but it's enough of them to keep us out of school. Yeah. All right. So time out for all of us. All Get behind these young people. <laughs> one day they're going to realize. Yeah. What? Banks, 
that's funny as hell, but he's going to be all about Black Lives Matter. We reached out to the, the local gang. We talked to all the OGs. So you don't need to be weak need about being in a damn hood. You know how we are, all right? <laughs> we already talked to the OGs. They're like, you good, Brother Washington. Do your thing. Is Julian going to be there? Yeah. <laughs> good. Let me know y'all money, all right? So get your money. And also, we still need vendors. I still have, I think, 15 spots. But we unfortunately are running out of spots for food vendors. I don't want to overstep anybody. I see, baby. I'm here for them. That's my daughter over there that wants my attention. Sorry. Oh, um, so we still need vendors. If you make something, if you sell something, if you do anything, we still do we still have space for performance? Um, we have some space for three more performances. Uh, Sister Yvette should have also mentioned, and we're going to close out. But early in that morning, down the middle school spark con is going to be speaking to over one million women via webcast we know that a nation could rise no higher than this woman we know that if you want to look at the uh, barometer of a nation look at the condition of the women we know that we're not for god himself the only thing worth worshiping would be you sister all right so we can't say that we all men without you. Amen. We can't say we all men mm -hmm. got to put the woman to the side where the woman gave birth to Christ. Mm -hmm. The one we prayed to had to come through that woman. That was Christ's first teacher. Mm -hmm. That was Muhammad peace be upon him. That was his first teacher. That was Moses' first teacher. But we always put our sisters on a back burner. So Sissy Bay has some uh, invitations up there. Nine o'clock. Uh, uh, nine o'clock, the door is open, 1698, Nebraska. You might say that you ain't a Muslim, but you remember the Million Man March. All yeah. the old brothers weren't uh, Muslim. And then we're going back this year for the 20th year of uh, the Million Man March. But we set the stage by elevating our women. Time out for men teaching women how to be women. That's wrong. We will always mess it up. Yeah. So please join us Saturday morning, 9 a.m. at 1698 Nebraska, and then join us here, 1 o'clock for Black Lives Matter Day, 418. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming out. Thank you to the Perfect Baptist Community Association for hosting us, and have a great night. Oh, my gosh.